Hey, I'm Jamie East and this is the Smart 7. And over the course of this week, we're taking a look back at the biggest stories from 2022. Today, it's what happened in May and June. Way back in December 2021, an investigation began into allegations around parties in Downing Street during COVID lockdowns. Former spokesperson Allegra Stratton resigned for making jokes about cheese and wine, and the first civil servant involved in the investigation, Simon Case, had to step away from the report because he was apparently at the events involved. After all of that, Sue Gray took over and her report was finally published on Wednesday the 25th of May, almost six months later, after a Met Police investigation that saw 126 fines issued. The report said that there were many events with cheese and wine and that those events shouldn't have been allowed to happen and that senior political leadership at Downing Street must bear responsibility for this culture. I want to begin today by renewing my apology for the whole country for the short lunchtime gathering on the 19th of June 2020 in the Cabinet Room. I take full responsibility for everything that took place on my watch. There was, however, no sign of a resignation or any further act of contrition. I am humbled and I have learned a, a lesson to speak. Speaking at a press conference in the Big Blue briefing room, Boris continued to make excuses. I, I thought the things that I, I was attending were work events. I, th- I thought that my job was to thank people for their contribution to public life, to government service. But plainly, we all made mistakes. His refusal to take any further action, despite multiple photos of him with drinks in hand and an email from his private secretary celebrating that we seem to have gotten away with it, didn't go down well in Westminster. Conservative MP Tobias Elwood made clear he no longer had confidence in Boris and had questions for his fellow MPs. Are you willing, day in and day out, to defend this behaviour publicly? And can we win the general election on this current trajectory? Labour's Chris Bryant, who's the chair of the Committee on Standards and Privileges, went a bit further. Does he show no contrition, no sense of shame that... Downing Street under him has been a cesspit full of arrogant, entitled narcissists. Just seven days later, Boris, as is traditional in times of great political crisis, sat down for an in-depth interview with Mumsnet. Yup. A user named Wallstone Craft wanted to know why Boris hadn't simply resigned. I just cannot see how actually it would be responsible right now, given everything that is going on simply to abandon a, a the project on which i embarked to, I get that. But, to, to but level a up. lot of our users will the, say the, if you've lost the trust of the people and your your government has lost the trust then you can't possibly be an effective prime minister and user it's getting weird certainly is wanted to know why having leaving drinks for work colleagues was more important than people being allowed to say their last goodbyes to loved ones what i thought i was doing uh, was simply doing what is right for a a leader in any circumstances, and that's to thank people for for their service. This was a time when we had to keep morale high and the whole place was under a huge amount of pressure. We didn't even get to the question from Che Guevara's hamster. As Russia's war in Ukraine entered its third month, the battle over the steel plant in Mariupol continued. The UN intervened to assist with evacuation and almost 500 people were able to escape. But the assault continued and Ukrainian President Zelensky said the damage is so severe they may have to dig out survivors by hand. We are negotiating and hope to continue rescuing people from Azovstal, from Mariupol. There are still civilians, women, children. In the current conditions, we cannot use special equipment to clear the debris. Everything is done manually, but we believe that everything will work out. Over the first weekend of May, Speaker of the US Congress Nancy Pelosi visited Kyiv and met for four hours with Zelensky. They discussed additional military aid and a plan to help rebuild Ukraine. She said America continues to stand with the people of Ukraine. We are on a frontier of freedom and that your fight is a fight for everyone. And so our commitment is to be there for you until the fight is done. Tuesday saw Boris Johnson make history as the first leader to address the Ukrainian parliament, appearing over Zoom with a message of praise and encouragement for the troops battling the invasion. And though your soldiers were always outnumbered, 
They fought with the courage and the energy of lions. You have exploded the myth of Putin's invincibility. This is Ukraine's finest hour. The ongoing war was marked by a series of high-profile visits to signal support from the US and Europe as Ukraine faced a Russian onslaught. Thursday the 16th of June saw another train full of visitors arrive into Kyiv with French President Macron, Italian PM Draghi, German Chancellor Scholz and Romanian President Iohannis all on board. They arrived to the sound of air raid sirens but the visit was without incident and the leaders toured the city and pledged more military support and that Europe would stand with Ukraine. They also made clear they would back Ukraine's candidacy for EU membership. Zelensky expressed his thanks and warned Russia remains a threat to Europe. Today Ukrainians are in the front line fighting against the Russian strikes, but we are not alone. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz also had words of condemnation. It's very clear this aggression on Ukraine marks the change of a time, of an age. And what Russia is doing here is unacceptable. 2022 was a dramatic year for the royal family. Queen Elizabeth kept a low profile, reducing her number of state appearances, and for only the third time in her reign, she missed the opening of Parliament back in May. It's understood she watched on TV as Prince Charles, along with Prince William and Camilla, did the honours at the formal state opening of Parliament, accompanied by Her Majesty's Crown, which travelled to the ceremony in a separate Rolls Royce. Her Majesty's government's priority is to grow and strengthen the economy and help ease the cost of living for families. June brought what became known as the Platy Jubes, but was in fact more formally known as a four-day celebration of the Platinum Jubilee of Queen Elizabeth II. The whole royal family gathered, including Meghan and Harry, but without Prince Andrew, who apparently tested positive for COVID. There was a flyby with jets in a 7-0 formation, the traditional trooping of the colour and plenty of marching and parades. Her Majesty didn't attend the ceremony in St Paul's Cathedral on Friday, but appeared to be enjoying her celebrations. Piers Morgan turned up on Fox News, talking up the British ability to celebrate. Britain is not the biggest country in the world, and we've probably had better times as a, as a nation. But my God, we do pomp and pageantry really better do. than Nobody anyone, else. I think, anywhere in the world. It's a magical spectacle. Yes, it is. And there were congratulations too from world leaders, including from Joe and Jill Biden. Your Majesty, congratulations on your platinum jubilee. For 70 years, you've inspired people with your selfless devotion and service to the people of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth. And Joe and I were so touched by the generosity and welcome you showed us when we visited you at Windsor Castle last year. Saturday saw the Platinum Party concert, which had over 13 million people rocking along to Rod Stewart, Queen, George Ezra, Andrew Lloyd Webber's greatest hits and Sir Elton John. There was also a moving moment as Prince Charles paid tribute to his boss. Your Majesty, Mummy. The scale of this evening's celebration and the outpouring of warmth and affection over this whole Jubilee weekend is our way of saying thank you. Sunday saw street parties and a slightly odd Platinum Jubilee pageant, which included a hologram of the Queen in a Golden State carriage, plus themed buses, floats and celebrities to mark the major cultural milestones from Her Majesty's reign. She appeared once again on the Buckingham Palace balcony and thanked the nation in a written note, saying she was inspired by the kindness, joy and kinship she'd witnessed across the four-day celebration. The aftermath of Donald Trump's chaotic insurrection continued to be felt throughout 2022. A bipartisan congressional committee investigated all the manoeuvrings and actions of Donald and his crew, culminating in a series of high-profile televised hearings that sought to bring home the enormity of the attempt to overthrow US democracy. Late June saw the hearings focus on Arizona and Georgia and the pressure Donald Trump applied to elected officials as he tried to overturn the legitimate election results. The Speaker of the Arizona House, Rusty Bowers, a lifelong Republican, had calls and visits from Rudy Giuliani and Jenna Ellis, who made exaggerated claims of election fraud and promised but never delivered any evidence. He said, we've got lots of theories, we just don't have the evidence. And I don't know if that was a gaffe or maybe he he didn't 
think through what he said. And the hearing also heard from Shea Moss, an election worker who got caught up in Donald Trump's claims and found herself and her mum persecuted after Rudy Giuliani accused them of passing around votes on a USB stick. She received racist abuse and death threats. Mr. Giuliani accused you and your mother of passing some sort of USB drive to each other. What was your mom actually handing you on that video? A ginger mint. The committee also focused on the US Justice Department and the pressure Donald Trump applied in the wake of the November election. The then acting Attorney General Jeffrey Rosen and acting Deputy Richard Donahue described having to continually convince the president that election conspiracy theories were nonsense, including a rumour about Italian satellites. Select committee confirmed that a call was actually placed by Secretary Miller to the attaché in Italy to investigate the claim that Italian satellites were switching votes from Trump to Biden. As he told Mr. Donahue in that December 27th call, quote, You guys may not be following the internet the way I do. The two men were almost replaced by an environmental lawyer, Jeff Clark, who proved more willing to do Trump's bidding. Toward the end of the meeting, the president, again, was getting very agitated, and he said, people tell me I should just get rid of both of you. Still to come on the special edition of The Smart 7, celebrities in court, and Kate Bush has a Stranger Things moment. Right after this. Welcome back. Johnny Depp and Amber Heard continued to wrangle in court throughout May. Amber had a time on the stand in the Virginia courtroom and she told the jury that her trial with Johnny Depp had been difficult and painful. In the first weeks of the trial, Depp testified that Heard was physically and verbally abusive to him and jurors heard audio recordings of arguments between the couple. But when she got a chance to have her say, things sounded quite different, including when she described what she said was the first time he hit her. I asked him about the tattoo he has on his arm. And to me, it just looked like black marks. And I said, what does it say? And he um, said, it says, why no? Um, I, I just laughed because I thought he was joking and slapped me across the face. And I laughed. I didn't know what else to do. I thought this must be a joke. The case finally wrapped up after six weeks and June the 1st saw the jury return their verdict. It was a unanimous victory for Johnny Depp over his claims of libel in Amber's Washington Post article and they awarded significant damages too, but not quite the $50 million he was originally looking for. As against Amber Heard, we the jury award compensatory damages in the amount of $10 million. As against Amber Heard, we the jury award punitive damages in the amount of $5 million. There was a minor win for Amber. She picked up $2 million over one of her three claims. This was about remarks made by Johnny Depp's lawyer in the Daily Mail, but her original lawsuit was for $100 million. Johnny's lawyer, Camille Vasquez, was pleased with the verdict. Today's verdict confirms what we have said from the beginning, that the claims against Johnny Depp are defamatory and unsupported by any evidence. We are grateful, so grateful to the jury for their careful deliberation. Johnny and Amber wasn't the only trial holding our attention during the long, hot summer. Early May saw the start of the so-called Wagatha Christie libel trial. Rebecca Vardy sued Colleen Rooney over the famed Instagram detective post. Colleen accused Rebecca of selling stories from her private Insta to the media in a dramatic post back in 2019 that said it's dot 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 Rebecca Vardy's account. Rebecca denies the story and sued for libel over untrue and unjustified accusations, which meant seven days of high drama as the case played out. Day one saw the Rooney's house referred to as a Morrison's mansion and poor old Peter Andre referred to as a <clears throat> small chipolata. Sky News reporter Bethany Minnell was in court. As far as money goes, these people don't need to win any money and that's lucky because they're not going to you know this is all about you know damages it's about reputation peter andre wasn't taking the chipolata thing well he used his social media to respond asserting that in fact he was closer to a sky remote than a tiny sausage hmm. oh and also to ask the world to stop making those chipolata jokes please i've took it for 15 years but it is a serious matter and even though you know some of you are going to go oh get over it don't say anything whatever you got to understand when it goes on and on and being brought up. And what's even worse is it's brought up in a high court. The trial wrapped after nine days as barristers from both sides presented their summaries and closing arguments for the libel trial that fascinated the nation. 
Colleen and Wayne Rooney weren't in court, and at one point, as Colleen's barrister was summing up, neither was Rebecca Vardy. Channel 4's Minnie Stevenson explains. There was a moment when Colleen Rooney's barrister was giving his final word on the case, and Rebecca Vardy walks out with her laptop. Now, we don't know whether she was upset or because she needed to get a flat white. It's unclear why, but you could read into that. Perhaps she just had had enough. The judge reserved her judgment, which was revealed later, dot, 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 in the summer. 2022 was a big year for Kate Bush. The English singer, songwriter and performer hasn't really been in the spotlight for quite some time, but Stranger Things season four changed all of that. Their use of her hit Running Up That Hill catapulted her into the record books as it hit the number one position around the world. It was 44 years since her last number one, and she's also now the oldest female to have had one. She emerged into the spotlight on Women's Hour to chat about the show and how much she likes it, even before it gave her a smash hit. Actually, we watched it right from the word go with the first series onwards, so I was already familiar with the series. You're already a fan at this point. Yes, yes, very much so, (laughs) yeah. I thought what a lovely way for the song to be used in such a positive way, you know, as a kind of talisman almost really for Max. And yeah, I think it's very touching actually. This has been the Smart 7. Wherever you're listening, do us a favour and hit the follow button. We'll be back tomorrow at 7am. Have a great day. Written, produced and published by Daft.